Appreciate it. Yeah, and I will start with a reminder, if you did not pick up a sign up for a committee sheet preference out front, please do. Turn that in in the basket before you leave. Uh, there's a description page of each of the committees that are going to be formed. The way we envision this working is we have a guiding executive committee <coughs> and subcommittees that do a lot of the research work that feeds into the executive committee who will make those recommendations to the appropriate entity. We hope to see ideas for public-private partnerships come out of this, for nonprofit uh, options, for further changes we can make in the city to help. There, there are many possibilities. And that's what Jeff is here for, to show us the range of possibilities that are, that are working in other places. Uh, Jeff is a recognized as a leading proponent of affordable housing and regulatory and finance policy and strategy. He's been a community development uh, director and development practitioner since he started as a VISTA volunteer in the 1970s. He's worked in diverse community settings, including directing a 30-town regional economic development organization, including one of Vermont's first Main Street organizations, and a community land trust. And we had some great conversations today about community land trust potential. Uh, he was the founder of the Vermont Community Loan Fund. Uh, Jeff became community development director for the city of Asheville in 2009. I was thrilled that we were able to hire him when I was the planning director there. Um, and he was promoted to assistant director of the community and economic development department. His work with the city of Asheville focused on affordable housing policy development and funding. For that work, he was recognized by the North Carolina Housing Coalition as Affordable Housing Professional of the Year in 2016. He retired from Asheville in 2017 and now offers community development consulting to local governments, nonprofits, and housing developers. I think there's much we have to learn and uh, look at its potential over time, as Jess and I often discuss, a place like Asheville does an awful lot with affordable housing but it started with seeds that grew. Their land trust started over 20 years ago. It looks very impressive now, but it started out very small. So these are wonderful ideas. I hope you'll enjoy learning about this. Jeff? Thank you. <laughs> and th thanks very much for um, having me here, um, Oxford. And um, I hope I say this right. Lafayette? Lafayette County, is that good? All right, very good. Um, uh, uh, just a couple caveats before we start. One, I'm an unabashed advocate for affordable housing. But as a practitioner for 30 years in the field of community development, um, I have learned that um, it is only through partnership and listening to all points of view that anything really happens in community. Um, it takes advocates, and frankly, it also takes people who um, have the distaff view, who think that uh, perhaps the community uh, doesn't need certain things in order to make things happen. Um, I was uh, telling Kevin that uh, um, back in my Main Street days, um, I uh, uh, was at a training with the National Main Street Center in Washington, D.C., um, which is part of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And Kennedy Smith, who's the director of the Main Street Center, said that she, she really um, thought about, about public process this way, that you have 40% of the people who are always going to be with you, and you have 40% of the people who are always going to be against you, and your job is to get one more than half of the 20% in the middle <laughs> to, to go with you. Um, and, and, you know, it's a lot of work to get there. So I want people to know that, that um, I think that both pros and cons in this discussion are legitimate, right? They're legitimate points of view. Um, I do not want to denigrate anyone's point of view when it comes to these issues in our community. But I hope I can present some information tonight that if you happen to be on that 40%, that you, you might think a little bit more about these issues. And if you happen to be on this 40%, speaking as an advocate, of course, that you will be, um, have more information at your um, behest that you can use um, when you have these conversations in your community with your neighbors, with the people who are your community members, um, with your elected officials, um, with your business people, with your developers, so you can really bring some tools to the table. And 
It's important to note that what I'm doing tonight with you is presenting you a catalog. I'm not presenting you with the answer or the answers. This is a catalog of many of the best practices in affordable housing development that have been used in communities throughout the United States and some internationally. It is not a one-size-fits-all issue. It is not, I cannot come from Asheville and tell you how to do it in Oxford, believe me, and I'm not going to. But what I'm going to do is help you see what the universe is, and then to be able to think about how you apply these to your local situation. Um, in the interest of time tonight, I, I would ask you this. If you have a question about what's going on here, um, Please do ask it during the presentation. And what, I'm, what I'd like to do, Judy will help with this, because I, we'll see whether I need this or not, because I can tend to get louder and more enthusiastic over time, and, and this starts to become an impediment rather than a help. Um, but I'm gonna ask you if you please use the microphone so this hearing impaired person can hear you, and so everybody can hear you ask those questions. However, if you feel like you need to make a statement, right, um, if you have a strong opinion about something, I would kind of ask you to hold that, to apply that at the tables when you're talking about, you know, what does our work look like? Um, but please don't use this as a forum tonight because it's, I'm not, again, I'm not promoting any particular point of view. I'm not uh, advocating any particular solution. What I'm, again, doing is helping to introduce you to the universe of solutions. And there, there is a clicker somewhere, but until I find that, I'll make sure that I'm somewhere around this thing, knocking, knocking this one out of you Okay, so let's, let's just start out so we're all on the same page about what affordable housing is, okay? So, affordable housing. Um, there is a national standard promulgated by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development that almost every local government uses. And that is that um, housing is affordable when it costs no more than 30% of the gross income of the persons who are living in that house, of the household. So it's not a, a family necessarily, it's a household that is living there, and that um, it, it includes, and it's gross income. Now if you're renters, rent utilities. Homeowners, ownership, cost. Mortgage, taxes, insurance, homeowner association fees, if you happen to have them. Um, why not utilities? Beats me. I mean, somebody made this stuff up, right? Like, so, so let's understand here that, um, uh, that, that there are additional costs. You want to pay utilities wherever you live. But when um, a, a bank is calculating your repayment ability for a mortgage, they're going to look at these things. They're going to look at mortgage, taxes, interest, insurance, and homeowner association fees. If you're applying to rent an apartment somewhere, they're going to look at is your income uh, are you paying more than 30% of your income for the cost of rent and utilities? And I'm going to talk about another factor before too long, but not right away, which is about the cost of transportation, which is an emerging trend in how housing costs are analyzed in this country. Let's also be really real about this. If you make $100,000, your household makes $100,000, theoretically, you should pay $30,000 for your housing costs. So you're going to pay somewhere, what would that be, $2,500 a month, something like that for your housing costs. And I, and I put this question to a friendly group of, of Asheville folks who said, who in here that makes $100,000 wants to pay $30,000 in their housing costs? And I didn't get anyone who responded positively to that. They thought that was too much. They said, I don't want to pay that much for my housing. Maybe, you know, $1,800 a month, something like that. I don't feel like I should be paying $3,000 a month for my housing costs. If you make $10,000 a year, theoretically you should be paying 3,000 of that for your housing costs. That leaves you $7,000 for everything else that you need to pay for in you and your household's lives. So it is very, very relative, and because of that, it is, it is a somewhat of a false way of looking at things, just so we are all on the same page of that. It, it, it really is relative 
to the marketplace, to your own family situation. I know a lot of young people that two working persons making what is probably a modest um, 50,000 uh, income each. They're only bringing home 70, and they're paying $2,000 a month uh, paying off student debt, right? So, you know, it's, it really is relative, and let's just keep that in mind as we talk about this. Then we talk about, okay, what is now we're going to, now we're going to define quote unquote affordable housing. And affordable housing is, according to HUD, is housing that's affordable to households at 80% of median income who are paying no more than 30% of their gross income for their housing costs. And this is um, what it looks like for, for um, Lafayette County, okay? Um, to, and you can see that, that HUD has determined that for a family of four, HUD, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, determined for a family of four, $65,000, roughly $66,000, is the median income. And they adjust this for family size. They adjust it for family size. Um, and then 80% then, by numbers of person and household, are the numbers that you see here. So what does, what does this look like? Well, let's look, let's look at it as, as rents, okay? So let's first go to the yellow portion. So if you make 80, if your household makes 80% of median income, right, you should theoretically should pay for a two bedroom apartment no more than a little less than $1,200, rent, rent, rent plus utilities. Um, if you make 60% of median income, you should pay no more than $853. So 60% for a family of four would be somewhere around 40,000, something like that. These are family of four, right? Family of two. Two, two, two. right here, this one. Okay, that's what I was looking at there. Yeah, so family, you have, yeah. so studio, this is um, no, I, I one person, bedrooms. two persons, three persons, four persons. These are two bedroom units or two, or two person houses? <laughs> These are, so that's a great question, thank you. So basically, HUD says, again, we use HUD as, as the, the great arbiter of, of, of nonsense here, but, but we, we use them because they're, they're making a lot of finance decisions and are behind a lot of finance decisions on how things get built, right? They're saying that this, a studio apartment can, can accommodate one person. A one bedroom apartment can accommodate two people, a two-bedroom apartment can accommodate three people, and a three-bedroom apartment can accommodate four plus people. That said, I mean, I'm not saying it's right, but I'm saying that that's how they decided. And so these numbers are generated from a one-person household, a two-person household, a three-person household, and a four-person household. Okay. Now, let's look at what the average is for um, the county. And in the county, the average cost of a one-bedroom apartment is 1000 and the average cost for apartment is a, a little over 1100 And HUD, when it provides subsidies to households through their Housing Choice Voucher Program, right, or through the um, subsidies that they provide for housing authority-owned units, they use the HUD fair market rents. The HUD fair market rent is roughly 40% of the mean, of the median, okay? Roughly 40% of the median. There's a, you can go online, and if you go online and look up HUD fair market rent, you can actually see a very complicated um, uh, mathematical description of how they, statistical description of how they actually define that. But practitioners typically say it's about 40% of the mean. And so they say that they'll pay no more than um, allow a household to, to, they'll pay no more than the difference between 30% of a household's income and $902 for a two bedroom apartment. Okay? So this is um, something I generated for Asheville, but I'm going to guess that it's relatively true for here. And I don't know how, how easy that is to see. So what this is showing is if it's in red, these are the professions that are unable to afford fair market rents. Now we're talking about um, uh, a single earner, right? Not, not multiple earners, single <coughs> earners. But you can see that in the three-person category, 
only the general and operation manager making a mean hourly wage of 49.62 can afford a uh, three bedroom apartment as a single wage earner. Um, and this, um, you know, just, you can see, like, for example, what's a, what's a good one for here? Um, how about we look at, um, oh, truck drivers. Truck drivers is a good one. 1811 can only, um, cannot afford a three bedroom unit. You know, if we look up at uh, registered nurses is the other category that can uh, theoretically afford a three bedroom unit on a single. So, Keep in mind, if you're, so if you're a single mom and you got two kids and they're 14 and 15 and they're a boy and a girl, you need a three bedroom apartment, right? And if you are a single earner making anything, you, you frankly cannot afford it. You frankly cannot afford it. And part of, the, part of why, why I show this is because a lot of times, I'm not saying it's true y'all here, but a lot of times when people think of affordable housing, they think about people who, only about people who are on public assistance as their only source of income to their household. And whether that's a retired household that's on social security only, or whether it's um, a disabled person, or whether it's a person that um, uh, through, because of economic displacement is homeless, you know, for all the reasons that a person would be on public assistance, they think that's, that's what affordable housing is defined as. I show you this because this is the workers of our, this is workforce housing, right? It's our workforce who needs housing. You're in a service economy here, right? I mean, primarily a service economy. These are almost all service jobs, right? So affordable housing is a key element in successful economic development. Key element in successful economic development. How would our hospital do it all if it didn't have CNAs, LPNs, transportation persons, parking attendants, people to clean the floors, custodial people. Our hospitals, for just as an example, would fall apart. Every one of those persons needs a place to live. So if, and I'm again, I'm not saying it's y'all, but if you did have the notion that that affordable housing was only for people who are on public assistance, let me disabuse you of that notion. It is for our society and what keeps our economy healthy is people being able to have a place to live that hopefully is close to where they work and where their kids go to school and where they get the services and the goods that they need. And there, here you hear the, the advocate. Okay, so what is, what is going on here? Well, um, in, uh, if somebody is cost burdened in their house, they're paying more than 30% of their income for their housing costs. That's a fairly simple equation. It'll go back to that 30% being a sum of false number, but it's again a way to think about how we're doing in our communities relative to our costs. And I will tell you this, in all honesty, it is successful communities that experience the most cost burdening, right? Communities that are in a terrible tailspin the housing is actually usually fairly affordable, right? You know, because it's uh, um, a, a lot of it's been empty. Um, people need to rent it. Uh, housing costs are low. Successful communities are the ones that housing costs are high. It's kind of it's a, an interesting anomaly, but it's it's the way our economy works. So in the city of Oxford, over 60% of the households are cost burdened, and even if you include all of the county, including Oxford City almost 60% of all households are cost burdened. There's additional piece of information I was not able to find, at least not within the time I had, and that is how many households are severely cost burdened. And that is households that pay more than 50% of their income for rent, or for, or for um, mortgage. Yes? How do you figure in I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let you ask this how, how do you figure in, we have so much student this um this information is generated through the US Census Bureau okay and the US Census Bureau um, counts persons at the place of their permanent residence 
So when I look at when I looked at the at the student population at Ole Miss at about twenty six thousand, right, and the total population of the and these are I'm going to use very broad numbers, so please don't don't uh, don't, don't pillory, pillory me for it. The population of the city of Oxford is around twenty thousand. We know that the majority, the great majority of those students are not included in that. Or to look at it another way, there are. Um, approximately 10,000 family, well, about 11,000 family houses, households in the county, um, with an average population of about <coughs> two, these are family households of about 2.6, so, and a 41,000 population for the county, and, and so it seems to me that if I extrapolate out, the great majority of students are not counted in these numbers. But this is, you know, you're going to have a data and research committee, you know, like this is, this is a, um, a consultant looking to make a buck trying to find some information to impress you that I know a lot about your place, right? And, and, and I frankly know very little about here. So this is the kind of stuff that you really want to delve into as you try to discern what are the appropriate solutions for our community. And so it's a great question in that regard. Okay? We all right with that for now? Great. The next thing that, that you try to, to, to try to analyze is, is what is a, a housing gap. And, uh, and um, so there's, there's, there's two ways of looking at things. One is housing need, and the other is housing gap. And to, to, to develop a housing gap, an accurate housing gap, you're basically looking at who's not housed in your community. Who how, what is the, how are people moving in and are being birthed into your community? So how, what is the change in population happening? How does that affect the change of households? Say every household represents one housing unit, theoretically. And we know that's not true, like many people don't love, but represents one housing unit. And then you further um, say, what's being built, right? And then you look at your gap and say, say so what's, from all those things that increase our housing need, subtracting what's being built, what's our gap? It does not include the people who are cost burdened or severely cost burdened because you say they're housed. At least they're housed, right? So when you think about a gap, you don't think about this. It's just how much new housing do we need? Um, in your 2015 study, most of the current housing demand seems to be generated by um, households Incomes under thirty-five thousand dollars. Again, very um, uh, uh, appropriate in the service economy. If we're thinking about that. Um, and in the 2015 study, it postulated that 400 affordable non-student rental housing units were going to be needed by 2020. Okay. That there's been an update, right? And in the 2018 discussion draft of your new comprehensive plan. It says that by 2023, 353 new rental households uh, um, are projected, um, and in the, that's um, uh, in the in the market area, which includes the county. So it's the city and the county together is that market area, and in the city alone, 154 new rental households are projected by 2023. And that's yeah, close to your gap. Now I will say that. Um, uh, it doesn't say whether it's affordable, except that most of the households are going to be making under thirty-five thousand dollars. So this is a piece of market information I think would be worthwhile for you to delve into further to try to further quantify what that is. It really helps to have a numerical something or other to go after when you're thinking about what do we really need in order to, to meet the needs of our community. And then we talk about affordable home ownership. So for that family of four, eighty percent of median income. Assuming a 20% down payment and a 30-year mortgage at 4.5%, that family can afford, that household can afford a, um, a $220,000 mortgage, so roughly a $250,000 house. Okay. And interestingly enough, um, uh, for a family of two, that's around a thousand, um, and uh, they can afford a mortgage of 168,000. Um, uh, then we look to further quantify this. We were, um, according to Zillow last week, 
the median home value, not sales price, just important to know that, the median home value about 215,000, um, and that 342 loans in the Oxford market area, including the county and the city, are for sale under $230,000, uh, 342 out of 760 homes. Further quantifying this in your uh, 2015 study, 190 to 200 a new affordable home ownership units needed, um, and in the discussion draft in large part driven by your growth, over a thousand new units. But interestingly, look that 58% of those units are projected to be needed by senior households. So we, despite the, um, the growth of millennials and the student population, what's really happening is your boomers are aging and they're looking to replace the units that they have and would prefer home ownership. And guess what? They, have, they might have some cash from sale, but they got a lot less money, right? They have a lot less money, and that's why affordable units are going to be needed there. And then you can see the Oxford City number. By the way, this is going to be, it's both being filmed and will be up on, I think, the city's website. Yes. So, so if, some, if, some, if I'm moving too fast or I feel to give, uh, feel like I'm giving a little too short on something, though, you can find it later, okay? All right, so just to, here's another rundown. I'll let you all read this yourselves, other critical um, housing issues here. Um, some of them are probably not surprising to you in any way. Um, it was very surprising to, for me to see that according to the, um, again, the American Community Survey, which is a five-year um, uh, census information, most recent one, over 20% of your housing units are considered vacant, um, which is, uh, to give you an example, in, in Asheville, it's 6%, right? So to give you a sense of, 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 of something that, that may well be because of the predominance um, of, of homes that are uh, second homes left vacant, perhaps rented seasonally for events that happen in your community, but otherwise are not available as permanent housing stock. They're not used for permanent housing. There's no need for them to be used for that purpose. I also understand uh, from Judy that there's been a, um, uh, some, some um, uh, recent uh, student built, private sector student built housing is, is vacant as well. Perhaps a, an over um, an over uh, supply might be happening in, in that particular uh, market area. Okay. Uh, I also wanted to talk a little bit just to put you in the context of what's going on nationally. Um, so nationally, throughout the United States, in every successful community, there is an insatiable demand for affordable housing. Why? Costs have risen like crazy. Costs have gone through the roof. Um, I was looking um, in, in, in Asheville, I was talking with an economist, um, and he showed me a, one of the most interesting graphs I'd seen. This was in like 2014. And he showed me, so let's, let's just assume probably that this, okay, here, is the number of males employed in the construction industry between the ages of 25 and 54 in 2007, okay? This is the number of males employed in the construction industry between the ages of 25 and 54 in 2013. That's what happened during the recession. Nothing was being built, and people who depended on construction for their livelihood needed to change their profession. They left the industry, and those workers have not been replaced. They have not been replaced. It's further exacerbated by immigration policies, uh, I just say that broadly, do not uh, take any particular political point of view of mine on that, just to say that it has a, had a real impact on things, by the fact that young people are not necessarily being encouraged to go into the building trades these days. They're, um, uh, they're, they're becoming skilled at other things. Um, and. Uh, um, and, and not uh, da, 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 um, the um, uh, construction workers and the skilled trades are aging out and they're not being replaced. And we haven't found a way 
to replace those workers. So construction labor is becoming very dear, and construction material costs have increased exponentially. They said, in fact, between, in one year, between December of 2017 and December of 2018, construction costs nationally increased by 20% in one <coughs> national. National cost of construction, 20% in one year. That's not something that you're necessarily going to solve, by the way. It's just something that you have to deal with, right, as we look at how do we address uh, affordable housing issues. It's not a great time for government funding for affordable housing. Um, it's not a great time for private sector. The, the banks, and, and how many of you are bankers? And because you can tell me whether you think this is true or not, but this is what I hear from the bankers I talk with, uh, but you don't have to tell me out loud, um, is, that, is, that, um, is that the regulation of the banks that occurred as a result of the overcorrection from the recession have severely limited their ability to finance the affordable housing, the housing in general that we need in this country. That's very broadly stated. Um, and I talk with developers who are finding that they have to um, mitigate risk to such a great extent in order to get the financing they need to build housing, particularly housing that um, may not return the margin of some other kinds of housing, affordable housing, for example, that it becomes um, that, that nervous banks are, are, have um, curtailed credit in a way, positive in a way, because there were so many abuses that happened you know, during the predatory lending period. But on the other hand, um, I'll tell you, in Asheville right now, again, talking about Asheville, we, have, we had, in 2007, we had 225 affordable condominiums go online. 220, selling at 115,000, 95 to 115,000. And there has not been one new affordable condominium built in the city of Asheville since 2008, since that project finished. Not one. Not one affordable condominium project. And the developers say it's because we have to, we still are requiring 70% pre sales in order to build. So just 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 be aware that that's a uh, part of the one. There, anybody everybody know what Nimby Yimby is? Nimby, not in my backyard. Yimby, yes, in my backyard. Um, real tension between these these forces nationally. Um, uh, look up Yimby. Um, what's going on in San Francisco, for example? So if anybody's interested in a real interesting take on what's what's going on, things it's, it's great. And you know what? It's not it's not all it's not all good. It's not all good. Yimmy, you know, you think, oh yeah, yes in my backyard, but yes in my backyard if it's this and not that, you know. So it's it's a little bit more nuanced. And yes, please build affordable housing in my backyard. Everything else, uh, I think we've talked about. One interesting thing is that more renters and fewer homeowners. And again, this is part of a reaction to um, to what happened during the recession. But one of the things that happened is that um, people who went underwater with their mortgages had to stay in their houses that they could keep them, right? They no longer had economic mobility. They couldn't go where the jobs were because they'd lose all the investment in their house. And um, that has made the next generation of, of young families and people coming up very nervous about being tied to a particular place Thinking that the market, you know, somebody is on, right, if you're on social media, the Lord knows if you're on social media, um, you know that you can always find something that says the world is going to end tomorrow, right? In fact, some people will tell you it's already ended, right? But we know that that, that is something that um, the, the propensity for um, people in their 20s um, and early 30s to purchase homes is lower than it's ever been in our nation's history. Yeah, so, yes? Uh, this is not political either. This is not political. It's not political. It's not political. It's not political either, but I would like to ask, how does this play into now as a homeowner? Lots of the write-offs that I could, uh, for my house now, you cannot even with the taxes or what you pay on there. So is it better for me to become a renter than to 
be on my own? Well, that's a great question. Um, I, I, I had, unfortunately, it's a very individual decision because you're not going to get any tax breaks as a renter either. And you're not going to earn equity. You're not going to. You're not going to. Yeah, but create I was wondering how would that play into more houses that people would buy for rent instead of what, not personally me. But and what's happening is is more rental units are being created than ownership units in cities throughout the country because rental units can be justified in most markets. Rental units can be justified in most markets, which means that the financing is developer is for developers is available in those markets based upon the market, their experience and the, and, the, and the market information. Basically, when it comes to rentals in successful communities, build it and they will come. But when it comes, what you don't see is speculative home ownership developments anymore. You see very, very few speculative development home ownership. Some of them in the, the Charlotte area, and in the Piedmont in North Carolina is an example where, there, where you're seeing speculative development. It's, it's growing so fast. It's accommodating almost anything that can be built, ownership or rental. <coughs> but in, in, in Asheville, is a great example, you're seeing almost exclusively rentals, <coughs> even now. Okay. All right. Um, I'm taking a long time, uh, and I'm going to try to speed this up um, and just say that here, this will be a thing, but here's some local government drivers, um, and this is important for you to think about. Um, you have um, increasing urban populations that, are looking, that want to be close to school services and all the things we talked about earlier, versus the people that want to protect their single family neighborhoods, not for good reason in some cases, and not so good reasons in others. Um, uh, the workforce housing need. Um, it, it reflected by chambers of commerce, interestingly, is now starting to drive local government decision making a lot more than it has in the past, um, because the employers are saying we need we need people and we need housing for people. You have to change your policies and regulations in order to create that. Um, other things I've talked about here. I'll talk about the low income housing tax credit program a little later. Cost construction. I um, just want to very briefly say that um, the, the Center for Neighborhood Technology about six, seven years ago um, launched a new initiative to try to redefine affordability. And it was called the H plus T index, housing plus transportation. Basically saying that, that if you consider the cost of housing alone, you really weren't considering the true cost of living someplace for um, the households that live there. So they started mapping communities, um, supported, interestingly, the Walmart uh, Foundation, the Pew Charitable Trust, I mean, two sides of a very big coin, you know, but uh, supported their work. And so now you can find an H plus T for many, many um, cities throughout the country where you look at a map and you see that if you live here, then if your H plus T is under 50%, theoretically, that's affordable. But as soon as it goes up over 50%, and you're finding that if this is the map of the place, this is the place that is 50% or less. Um, so I'd say in a, in a place like here, it's, a very, it's, it's important to be thinking about this as you think about where should housing be located. Because the further out you are, the more it's going to cost to get to where you need to be. Not only in dollar cost, but in lifestyle cost, family time cost, child care cost, cost of gasoline, grocery cost, uh, everything is going to cost more the farther away you are. And so considering transportation as part of the strategies that you put in place for affordable housing is a very important part of, of the work. Okay. We're going to look at models of success. Um, and uh, let's see here. Uh, and I, I think I'll talk about each of these um, as I talk about specific tools. So I'm going to move quite through. Now, here's the, here's the catalog of the local government tools that I'm going to talk about in detail. And I want you to know that it's easy for me to stay awake um, here at 5.30 or 6 o'clock because I'm up here with a microphone and I'd be so embarrassed if I just dropped over and fell asleep here. And you probably haven't eaten anything, you've done and been busy all day, and, and I'm, I'm only mildly entertaining. 
So I apologize um, that, that this is mostly text to me. Um, uh, please take a snooze if you need to. I, my feelings won't be hurt. Again, this will be up on the website, and there'll be a film of it or something that you missed. Um, I'm going to talk about local government finance. I'm going to talk about uh, land. I'm going to talk about capital improvements and in infrastructure, tax incentives, alternative ownership, and regulatory partnerships. Okay. Let's start out with, with um, financial incentives. The most <coughs> typical and, frankly, the most number one widely used local government incentive across this country for affordable housing is to an affordable housing revolving loan on also often called the housing trust fund. Um, this is where uh, a local government, either through an annual general fund allocation or a one-time capital infusion, sometimes through through a general obligation bond, right, where the community goes into debt, right, to support um, the, um, the 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 financing for affordable housing, um, or through sale of property is another way it, it gets funds, um, makes direct loans, becomes a bank, and makes a direct loan to either a developer or a homeowner. Now, it, I have never seen an example where it ha has such a, a monetary volume and size that it can be the primary financer of the entire financer. It's usually the gap that what it's providing is the difference between what would um, uh, a developer be able to leverage through a private sector loan and what the developer needs to raise in financing in order to create an affordable housing development. Keeping in mind that it is that lower interest rate of that additional debt, which sometimes is considered by the bank as equity or close to equity, that allows the developer to accept a lower rent, hence a um, less um, income, right, um, to uh, and still be able to afford the debt service and operating costs and have a decent return on their investment to create that affordable housing. In the case of a homeowner, it's the difference between what the house, a modest house cost and what the homeowner can get a mortgage for, oftentimes making up some portion of that 20 to 30 percent that is required by the bank in order to um, qualify for that first mortgage. And is often um, uh, done as a silent second that doesn't need to be repaid until the home is sold. Okay, so that's the, the basic structure of how these deals tend to, tend to work. An example, City of Asheville has a housing trust fund. It was, it, for 20 years, almost 20 years, it's been funded with roughly one cent of the tax rate. One cent right, of, of every dollar collected in property taxes has gone to support that trust fund. Um, that kind of fell a little bit apart in, in more recent years. It, it actually became, now keep in mind, Asheville is 90,000 people, okay? It's 90,000 people. Um, so it's, um, what, uh, four times, four and a half times the size of Oxford, if you look at Oxford. Um, but it is capitalized at uh, housing trust funds to the tune about a half a million a year. And it has allowed the interest that's been earned on that from uh, everything is a loan. Everything is a loan. Now, the, the terms are flexible. Um, in fact, if you are willing to build um, uh, housing for that will be affordable to households at 60% or less of AMI without additional subsidy, right? Then um, you can get a 2% interest only loan. And that loan can be for the term that you agree to keep the housing affordable. So you if you agree to keep it affordable for 20 years, you get you don't owe you don't owe the principal amount until the end of that 20 year term. And that loan can be renewed at the end of that 20 year term if you agree to keep that housing affordable. Um, so this has been, um, this, this tool has helped create like 2,000 affordable units in the city of Asheville, um, roughly 100 units a year over that period of time, without any other um, 
federal funds or any other kind of, 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 of funding uh, system. So it's been a very, very key resource um, and um, actually has survived many different political makeups of the Asheville City Council um, because it has supported both households at low income as well as supporting the business community and helping them do something good for the community. Um, uh, and, and, and there have been um, very, very, very limited defaults. Very, very, very limited defaults. Um, well, here's an example. Again, I'll leave it up here for you, but just you can see that um, that uh, this um, bow catcher scattered site development, um, this, this developer now is completing a 70 unit development, the largest one he's done. He's going to have 150 affordable units. One is a family business, 150 affordable units, 100% affordable units that he's developed with the assistance of the Asheville Housing Trust. So you can see even from a purely private sector side, um, this is not using low income housing tax credits or any of the other programs. This is how and this is, uh, has been a key element of really increasing the size of affordable housing. And as I said, this, this is happening in communities throughout the country. Um, next thing I'll talk about, local government owned property. Um, this is where local government makes land available for development of affordable based income or mixed use development, but affordable being an essential part of that. Um, Judy asked me the question, was this um, surplus land? And I would certainly say in Asheville, it is it has not been land that's been considered surplus. It's land that is not needed for municipal purposes. But in many, many cases, it's it's been valuable land. For example, the city of Asheville had a, um, a parks maintenance facility. It was a, a, literally downtown. Quonset Huts downtown on a piece of property that's appraising at more than a million dollars. You know, it's an acre appraising at a million dollars. And the city of Asheville made that land available for affordable housing because the parks maintenance facility had outgrown it and needed another place. And the city did not have another municipal function for that land. And is going to be under development um, uh, this summer for a 60 unit um, affordable, actually mixed income rental housing project um, where uh, half of the units are going to be affordable to households at 80% or less and 20 are going to be affordable for households at 60% or less. And the city um, is making that land available um, basically um, uh, for nothing as its, as its form of assistance to the developer and the developer is pledging 40 years of affordability um, at those terms for, for, for that period of time. Now, I will say, again, I'm not trying to suggest that any of these are your strategy, but I will tell you that these things are being put in place throughout the country, and this is one way that it's happening. And by the way, it is, it, it, and that property, that protection, that 40 year protection, will be uh, a deed protection and the developer will cede that property to the city of Asheville if it if the developer and subsequent so it's not something that can be undone through sale. So these are covenants to the title, and if, if that is not kept, that property will revert back as improved to the city of Asheville, to the city of Asheville to you know find another manager, property owner, etc., who will, who will live with the constraints of, of, the, of that title covenant. Um, so here's a, again some questions that, that you might want to be thinking about um, as you think about this kind of thing. So something might be helpful for you in your research. Um, let's move along. Yeah, another way that that that, that local governments um, assist in the development of affordable housing is for land bank through land bank. Why why land bank? Well, in, five years ago, again I'm going to the city of Asheville. You could, um, you could. We we bought a we bought a property at, at a foreclosure. We had it was one of the defaults in our um, in our housing trust fund. Um, but the collateral had been pledged not only on that project but on 16 acres adjacent to that project. So through the foreclosure process, the city of Asheville bought that for bought that 16 acres for 300,000 and it appraised at 350. 
This was actually in 2010. That property just appraised at 1.2 million now in 10 years. Um, so the city essentially banked that land during that time. And this summer, we'll put that out for an RFP for mixed income housing development. And so land banking essentially allows the local municipality to purchase property and stop the march of appreciation that's happening on that property, allowing it to be used for that, for the express purpose of affordable housing when the market um, and, um, and finance and development conditions are right. So it uh, um, can be a very, very helpful, helpful process. Um, and um, it allows also the city to partner with developers to think about the pipeline. And the pipeline is a term that we use to define how much affordable housing is going to be produced two years, five years, 10 years. Local governments oftentimes um, uh, invest in capital improvements in their community. And one of the places they can invest capital improvements is in affordable housing. Um, it can be done, and you'll see this a little later, but it can be done for infrastructure, it can be done for land banking. Um, these are investments that the city makes that the developer does not necessarily need to make. It's, it's sort of a, um, um, you know, a back way in method of subsidizing affordable development. Um, uh, I, again, one of the things you'll have to discern is what you can do in the state of Mississippi. In the state of North Carolina, you can actually use capital um, uh, improvement funds to finance studies. So you have a piece of land, you're not sure of the geotechnical condition of what's under, underground. Was it fill? Um, is there unknown water sources? Is there, um, are there, uh, you know, any number of things could be, could be rocky, right, under, 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 the, so under, the, under what you can see. Um, we can do that kind of testing so we can determine the suitability of a piece of land for development and we can use capital improvement funds to do so. Um, generally, these are budgeted by local governments annually, but oftentimes, you know, local governments need to approve a budget annually, but they can project what those needs are going to be over a period of time um, and need to do so as they project their debt payments over a period of time. So the capital improvement funds become a really helpful um, way of thinking about that. Also, many, many, many communities also invest in capital improvements, what's called pay go, pay as you go, right? And these are even more flexible than debt funds in terms of helping to move future projects along. So it's something to, to be thinking about in terms of the tool. Historically, the reason the suburbs have grown, right, is because local governments, state governments, invested in public infrastructure that allowed for um, residential subdivisions, large commercial big box developments, you know, that, that allowed the growth of our suburbs because they put roads, water, and sewer, storm drainage out to those places. Now many local governments are starting to say, what if, what if we invested in infrastructure that was expressly and only to support affordable housing? Um, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a very small example. We had a developer in, in the city of Asheville that was um, looking to, uh, had found a, a, a reasonable piece of land, reasonably priced, and was going to put 12 units of affordable housing and an infill on that. Come to find out, the road that he was going to put it on was a private road. And the city of Asheville did not allow the development of a 12 unit subdivision on a private road, um, unless there was a homeowners association said it was going to pay the cost of the upkeep and maintenance of that road. The city of Asheville went in and um, in a partnership with a developer, we, the city of Asheville, paid for half of bringing that road up to the standards necessary for that road to be taken over as a city street, and the developer paid for half by reducing his cost of development by half in order to do that development. Very simple, easy, it was an easy thing to do. The city was able to do it through forced labor, 
Um, so we wouldn't, didn't have to go out the contract, it would happen really quickly. And we had 12 units of affordable housing within a nine month period in a, in a way that we otherwise wouldn't have, wouldn't have been feasible and would have stopped this, this development, which was in a great location, a nice product, very affordable, and part of the deal was the developer agreed because of that to add an extra 10 years of affordability onto the, the, the covenant because he had housing trust funds, right? So instead of 20 years of affordability, he agreed to 30 on that. So this is uh, the, the, the way that, that the city was able to really make that kind of, of, of development not only possible, but extend the length and term of development. A complicated subject matter is how do we use tax incentives in order to support affordable housing development? Um, the the, uh, the, the uh, TIF, um, which is tax increment financing, has typically been used in cities to support the development of infrastructure that allow the private sector to um, develop a piece of property that had a relatively low tax value into a higher tax value and use the taxes collected on that higher value property to pay for the improvement of the infrastructure. So it's been kind of turned around in the affordable housing business. And, and what, um, what, what is being done is we're saying, if you build that affordable housing, we will only tax you for a period of time at the pre-development value of that real estate, of that land, right? So let's say that land was worth, oh, I don't know, let's call it a million dollars. Say the land was worth a million dollars, um, undeveloped. And the post-development value was $10 million. Just to, this, the city will agree to tax that developer, to tax that, that improved parcel, at the $1 million value as opposed to the $10 million value for a period of time, depending on how the development meets the city goals. So if we look here, you see this chart, you can see how the developer would gain points. And for every 10 points, they would get one year of essential, in, in North Carolina, you're not allowed to abate taxes. So what, what happens is the developer pays the taxes and then gets a grant of that amount of tax back in return. They have to provide the city with the performance data. So they have to provide rent rolls, showing that they are meeting the agreements that they, you know, that, that, they, that they actually earned the points that they said they were going to earn. Um, and, um, and again, it becomes a deed of covenant. So if they do not, so you know, the developer says, oh, well, I'll just pay you back those taxes. No, it's a deed of covenant. So if the developer goes bad on the agreement, the developer now can be sued by the city because they have violated the conditions of their title, right? So this has been relatively successful in providing an additional incentive um, it's, it's, it's not ca upfront capital, and it's important to note this is an operational subsidy. Um, so what it goes in, is into the developer's operating flow form. Very good. Okay, so this is a complicated thing. Um, you'll find some stuff about it, and I'm happy to talk more about it with you, with anybody who wants to talk about this. Um, but it, it, this is, that, that, that um, particular program um, started in Asheville, um, is now becoming implemented across North Carolina communities. So it's one of the one of the few things I did that was actually innovative. Um, kind of took the city of Asheville and it's uh, being, being sp it's spreading around through other North Carolina communities. So it's pretty exciting. Okay, there are also alternative ownership models that are worth considering. And one that I happen to be very personally very interested in um, is the community land trust model. And simply stated, in the community land trust model, the, the family, the homeowner, owns the improvement, and the community, through a nonprofit organization, owns the land, and removes the value of the land from the cost of the home to the homeowner. 
basically takes that away. And in return, the homeowner agrees of one, it's inheritable, it's an inheritable title on that property, or if it's a, um, a condominium, because condominiums also, it's a renewable 99 inheritable lease, right? The homeowner agrees that upon the time when they are choosing and they opt to sell that improvement, they agree to accept a limited return on the appreciation of that. What's on the market appreciation? If 100% of the mortgage that they pay, 100% of the value of physical improvements that they made, if they physically improved the property, 100% of any cash down payment that they provided, but a limit on the appreciation. So if the property um, uh, appreciated, uh, a very common um, uh, formula is the homeowner gets 25% of the appreciated value and the community retains 75%. So let's say, let's make it easy. The depreciated $20,000, $20, the homeowner gets $5,000 at the time of the sale, and the community retains $15,000. So let's say that the property costs $150,000, and the subsidy provided was, oh, I don't know, let's say $100,000, uh, you know, it was $30,000, brought it down to $120,000. At the subsequent sale, it's now, the property is worth $170,000 but the community land trust can sell to the next buyer at 125,000, 120,000 plus the 5,000 of appreciated value that went to the, the, the seller of that property. It is, a, it is a methodology for, I use this term very, very um, cautiously, for perpetual affordability. It's a mechanism for perpetual affordability. So this is there now, how many? 200, 250 community land trusts throughout the United States. Um, uh, one, well, one is now just getting started in Nashville. Um, it was actually fought for years by a nonprofit organization that, that actually was getting most of Nashville's um, funding that went to nonprofit organizations that really didn't want to share the pool. Um, but Nashville passed a $25 million general obligation bond for affordable housing. And so there's a now a, kind of enough money to go around, right? And so now, now it's really got the shot in the arm and should be up and operate. It's actually as a board of directors, it's incorporated, it's gotten its 501c3, and it's looking now to raise its initial operating funds and buy its first homes. So this is, this is a, a, a very important mechanism of helping preserve affordable housing in place as opposed to a down payment assistance, right, which helps one household, the household sells their home, well, you get the money back, but that house now is probably no longer affordable because there was no advantage to that homeowner to sell a house for less than its market value. Yeah. <coughs> um, and I, that's essentially what I just told you. Um, limited equity co-ops, um, I'm not gonna talk too much about this. The National Consumer Cooperative Bank um, when it folded, uh, uh, um, uh, essentially when it was disenfranchised by Congress, um, essentially ended the era of limited equity co-ops. And it's really too bad because um, these were very, very, very important ways for very low income people to become homeowners. Because the financing was based upon the, um, the value of the property and a loan to a corporation, not the individual credit of those participants of those stakeholders and stockholders in the co-op. Um, but uh, so um, I, th I think it's due for a resurgence, perhaps in a different uh, national political environment. I think it's worthwhile knowing that there are still 100 limited equity co-ops out there throughout the country that are thriving and doing, doing well. Um, I, I bring up, uh, I don't write a lot about PHA's Public Housing Authority. Um, not gonna talk a lot about that here. But I would say the public housing authorities are probably in a very um, newly unique position to begin looking at being developers, managers, and owners of a more diverse stock of affordable housing, um, uh, which uh, is something that was started really through changes in um, how the subsidy was provided to uh, public housing authorities through the Rental Assistance Demonstration Program. Um, allowing public housing authorities to actually um, become privatized owners of their affordable housing and the land. 
and be able to then parlay that asset into improvement financing, enter into public-private partnerships, opportunities that were not available under the prior ways that public housing authorities were organized um, and funded by HUD. So just something to keep in mind, I had a, a nice uh, talk with uh, the executive director of your public housing authority earlier today, and um, um, I, I just uh, um, I really appreciate hearing everything that, 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 um, that this public housing authority has done for your community. Two other things to think about, um, manufactured and tiny home villages. So think um, mobile home parks um, that actually make sense in today's world. Um, one of, one of, one of the uh, preview of a takeaway that I'll bring to you is one of the things that, that, that I say about affordable housing is that, is that to have affordable housing, you have to build it affordably. And um, one of the things that Mississippi learned from Katrina is that you could build affordable manufactured housing and have it in place and be indistinguishable from stick-built housing as part of the recovery from Katrina. This happened all along the coast. Um, in fact, I know some of the developers now who did that development. Um, and um, I have a developer in Asheville who is now building affordable apartments. Um, this may be meaningless to you. He's building them at $85,000 per unit. And with some assistance from the city of Asheville, no more than 20,000 per unit is able to make 30-year commitments to keep them affordable to households of 60% or less of the income. Our tax credit developers are building units at $150,000 per unit. That's the cost of building a tax credit unit. So all those soft costs, all the additional codes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that are necessary in order to satisfy the requirements of the program. The largest affordable housing program generator in the United States right now is a low-income housing tax credit program. But I got a guy in Asheville who's, who's making exactly the same commitment of 30-year affordability to households of 60% of less of median income with 20,000 a unit in additional debt from the city of Asheville, not having to go through any of that stuff. It's taking three to five years to get a low-income housing tax credit um, unit on the ground um, in Asheville. Other places are doing it much better and faster. Um, it's taking him nine months to get 70 units because they're, the units are being built in the factory. He's not dealing with labor um, uh, uh, availability, which is a big problem in Nashville. He's getting them trucked to the site. They, oh, he's putting up 10 units at a time, and from the start of his foundation to a finished unit, 30 days, he has a unit ready to occupy. Time is money to the private sector, and he's figured out really how to make these things, things work. Um, and you've heard a lot about tiny homes, I'm sure, if you're reading anything about what's going on in response to homelessness in the country. Um, I'm not sure if it is the, if it is appropriate in every community. Um, you still are talking about um, isolating communities of the poorest people by themselves in very, I would say, probably difficult to manage situations. But I think that, that one, very positive conclusion, you can say that it's a lot better than the industry. Um, and it's it, communities are being able to mobilize volunteers um, on sort of a habitat on steroids kind of thing to get these things built and in place. Um, and many reports that these are making incredible differences in people's lives. Um, so these are building typologies. What is happening in the tour today with Judy? Um, as we toured around. In fact, you know, if you took uh, well, Keystone, you took Keystone, right? People know Keystone is these little cottages, one and two bedroom cottages, single story cottages, very tight lot lines, you know, um, small lots, fairly dense, not significant infrastructure. Um, if you just did those with manufactured homes, right, at, at a cost probably to put them, uh, what, what, uh, I know a guy who's converting a mobile home park in Asheville to all um, uh, uh, non-metal chassis, um, uh, to code, to real building code, not, not to mobile home building code, converting a mobile home park, 200 units to these manufactured homes. He's able to put a home on site 
in there for um, less than $60,000. Where do you move into? So this, as well, as long as it's well managed, this really could be another way of thinking about it. You have the land resource of how you could really bring um, a, 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 an affordable um, uh, uh, housing, quick to produce model of housing into your your community. Um, and the question will be, you know, the, is it meeting the standards for both the building? Um, is it a sustainable building? And can you manage it successfully? Um, permanently affordable <coughs> home ownership. Um, uh, I've talked enough about that, and it really ties into the community land trust. Regulatory set of partnerships. Um, not, my, 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 um, unfortunately, I had enough conversation with people like Judy and other planners to be able to talk a little bit about regulatory stuff. Um, but I would say that things like density bonuses, um, where you are able to increase your density if you agree that a certain percentage of the development will be affordable, allowing, therefore, the developer to increase the amount of units, reducing the per unit cost for infrastructure and land, and still able to accept a reasonable, get a reasonable return on their investment. Um, accessory dwelling units, um, which are a hot trend nationally um, for permanently affordable housing as opposed to seasonal rentals. So they're saying, if you build this housing, um, uh, mother-in-law apartments, a lot of people think of them that way, um, uh, and agree to um, manage it you know, as a homeowner, you can increase the value of your property. Um, where City of Asheville is now providing financing for, for that. Um, construction financing, because the banks won't finance unless you have sufficient equity to, to build that. But once it's built, the bank will take out the financing, right? So we're, as, long as, as long as you have it rented, it now becomes something um, that's, that's very possible. So the city of Asheville is providing financing for accessory dwelling units as long as it's for permanently affordable housing. Um, and reviewing, most developer, private sector developers will tell you that um, the reason we're not building affordable housing is because from a regulatory standpoint, you make it too expensive to build affordable housing. So many, many communities are reviewing their regulatory processes and say, is this something that we really need? Can we fast track affordable housing in order to um, make our regulatory environment more friendly for developers wanting to build affordable housing? Uh, finally, I just mentioned the missing middle. Um, infill, usually in existing neighborhoods or as part of a mixed use development. Um, it really makes sense to make it work within existing, your existing regulatory environment rather than have to create new zoning districts, et cetera. Um, but it does allow for strong relationships with existing neighborhoods. And this is where you um, build to scale of those neighborhoods. Um, it allows local developers to participate oftentimes in the provision of affordable housing in your community. Um, when many times the size of the developments and the financial capacity needed to take on the kinds of things that are really being 150 units or something like that are out of the capacity of the local developer to be certainly to be so truly national. So just to, and Judy and I were talking a lot about, um, about that today. Um, in order to do this stuff, you need to have capacity. And that capacity is both in the poor and nonprofit. I just, I just put a list down there of some of the um, uh, some of the, the the ways that communities have built capacity, and perhaps some of the um, organizations or or the potential for capacity you may already have in your community. But I will tell you that this stuff doesn't happen because just because you want it to. You really have to have a dedicated effort in order to make this happen. And building that capacity, whether you build it solely here. Or you can build it in partnership with organizations that have regional or statewide profiles and might be looking to expand into an Oxford market. You can look at how you can increase your capacity through those kinds of partnerships. Um, also happening now, you know, just out there in the world, if you're looking at tools, there are communities now that are crowdsourcing affordable housing development, particularly in terms of missing middle developments. So they're actually raising through this 
uh, sale of shares in new developments in order to preserve and keep affordable housing in their community or to build new affordable housing, zero net energy developments, um, including loose top, rooftop leases of solar um, developments that allow for um, reduced utility bills, which is an important part of the cost of, of uh, finance, H&T finance, uh, housing plus transportation, talk about that. The reduction in size of housing happening all over the place. Um, and I mentioned resident-owned communities because um, this is um, a trend that's been happening for about 15 years in terms of mobile home parks, where mobile home park owners are joining together with technical assistance from this national organization, Roth resident-owned communities, and are becoming owners of their mobile home parks. And you can find a lot of information about that online. And, and some, some of these are just like stunning success stories, and others are mildly success stories. Because come to find out that people like the idea, but when it comes to actually governing your, your mobile home park, it's not actually a whole lot of fun. Um, but uh, anyhow, it is something that's going on in terms of the thing. So in summary, affordable housing costs no more than 30% of a household's income. Um, the, lower, the lower the income, the harder it is to find. That probably is evident, but, but it needs to be stated. Um, and it's especially difficult for folks at 60% of median income or less. Um, uh, more than um, half of your um, uh, renters are cost burdened, and a recent market analysis so the hundreds of new rental and home ownership units are needed here. So um, my takeaways, um, that local resources are necessary. These days, there's not enough federal or state money anymore to do this without looking for local resources. Um, if we really want housing to be affordable, we need to build it affordably. And then we need to find out ways to keep it affordable. It's no good if we build something, give somebody a lot of incentives to build um, housing that's affordable for 10 years, and after 10 years, everybody that sees their rent go up by 200 bucks a month. It does nobody any good. It creates a crisis. Um, City-owned land developed in partnership with experienced developers, both for-profit and non-profit, um, has often been the best short-term solution to really get some affordable housing in the ground. Local housing trust funds are used all over the United States as a viable source of capital, funded both by general fund allocations and by um, special debt instruments um, that allows everybody to share the cost of that over time, usually, but at a low impact on the tax rate. Um, and that's the general obligation bond, which can be a real shock. You know. So um, um, I welcome um, no. emails no. and other contacts, <laughs> um, but that's it. Thanks a lot. <laughs> with a lot of information. Uh, we don't have time for questions now. We are, the next thing we're going to do is we have tables set up for each of the committees that we want to form to work on this. Uh, before we go do that, I have two ladies who need to make important announcements, but I just wanted to let you know after that, we'll be directing you back to these tables. We want you to fill out the form on the committee that you want to join. But right now, first I'd like to ask uh, Alderman Al Antonelle has something she'd like you to know about. I want to recommend to you a book that I just finished called Evicted. It follows, the author is a sociologist who follows several families who are paying 70 to 80 percent of their monthly income on housing. It's, it's a compelling and distressing book. The university every year has a and read. They distribute a, a certain book to the faculty and the incoming freshmen. And this is the book that they selected for this year. So everybody at the university is going to be kind of on board with this issue of affordable housing. It's really good. Uh, the epilogue is full of really important information and recommendations. So evicted by Matthew Desmond. Thank you, very timely. And Ms. First Ball wants to ask, has something. She's having trouble finding people to help her with the census. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, I work for the Census Bureau. We're in the process of trying to hide individuals who work for the census. You know, the census happens every 10 years. We are back now to the point of doing the census again. A few years ago, we lost a representative uh, because our population was down, or as I say now, we just didn't fill our census out and send them back in. So we couldn't count our population. For every person that we do not count, our state and the community lose $2,053. So we do have jobs available.
it pays between $14 to $18 an hour, plus 58 cents per mile. There are two types of jobs left. One is called an enumerator. I simply call it a mapping person because that's exactly what you will be doing. You'll only work in the county in which you live. And uh, it is extremely important that we <coughs> fill all of our slots so that we can get all of our citizenry county. One of the things that I couldn't understand about funding coming in was why in North Mississippi we did not get very much funding. It went to Central and South Mississippi. Well, I found out when I started working for the Census Bureau. It's simply that in North Mississippi, we don't fill out our census and send them back in. The last census, we only did about 20% of our people. Think about how much money we lost. Want to get some affordable housing? <laughs> we can get some grants coming in if we get our people counted. So you go to 2020census.gov forward slash jobs. Thank you, Ray. <laughs> I thought that was important, and she's right. We, we need the census to be accurate and complete. So now, uh, if we hope everyone's interested in working on one of our committees, uh, uh, J.R., Hollis, Gray, Marvin, y'all get to your tables. <laughs> Molly's there. <laughs> um, and it, each of the tables, there's a description of what the vet committee's going to be working on. There's going to be just a general conversation. Before you leave, we need the little slip of paper that says, here's the committees I'd like to work on in order. Leave that in the basket out front, but we have about 30 minutes to sit around and talk. And then after this discussion, we'll be getting back in touch with everybody. If there's anybody else you want to volunteer to be on a committee, sign them up, let me know. <laughs> and we have these comment cards. If there's questions you want answered, if there is research you want done, fill those out and put them in the basket, and we'll follow up on that. Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Jeff.
you still Are you going to be doing that? I'm not. Not too much. <laughs>